Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today's guests are both cancer survivors and teach us the power of resilience when it comes to facing trials in their lives, Scott Hamilton and Rhonda Hodge. Our first guest is an Olympic gold medalist and champion figure skater, Scott Hamilton. After losing his mother to cancer and then becoming a cancer survivor himself, Scott became an activist against the disease. He launched the Scott Hamilton Cares Foundation and other programs, including chemocare.com and the Fourth Angel Mentoring Program. Scott talks to us today about his journey to skating stardom, how his wife led him to a close relationship with God, and how surviving cancer gave him purpose. I'm Scott Hamilton. I've been around a long time in uh, figure skating circles. I competed for many years and then I toured as a professional. I've been very involved in the cancer community and Special Olympics and, oh my goodness, a um, myriad of things. I like to do uh, corporate speaking or just any kind of speaking. and. I like to write books, so it's been uh, a lot of work and a lot of fun. I'm a married man. I've got a beautiful wife named Tracy and uh, four children, so we're very busy. And uh, life is full and good. I was adopted at six weeks of age, which comes with this really cool thing. For the parents, there's like limited expectation. Like, you know, it's, when you're a birth child, it's like, oh, you know, it's probably gonna be academic or athletic, or they have my nose or your chin or my eyes or whatever. When you're an adopted child, it's kind of like, what's gonna happen here? It's like, we, don't, we have no expectation. But when I was growing up, it was just a f fun household. Uh, my parents were great parents. So my parents uh, liked church. They liked going to church. And I really feel, looking back on it, I never really got the sense that they were dedicated um, in their faith life. I think that my mother was completely and um, phenomenally compassionate. So she lived as a Christian would live and, you know, really being a part of the community and really um, helping people in difficult times. And we did the church thing. I went to Sunday school. And then I started skating on the weekends and it just sort of went away. Um, I always look back on that now and if you can look at all the different little moments and different things and there was always a belief there in something. There was always something inside of me and I'd always be very prayerful and I knew that um, I needed him. I was uh, a very happy, undersized uh, little boy that um, they figured out after a while that maybe the fact that I wasn't growing was unusual not to be expected. And it was when I started showing some signs of stress. Um, uh, you know, my skin color was wrong. Um, I, I had a distended belly. I didn't have proper grow, uh, muscle development. and they, So it became very obvious that something was wrong when tracking me against other kids my age. And so I started going from hospital to hospital to try to find um, any clue as into why I'm under such physical stress and um, why I wasn't growing properly. And so it started off um, local hospital, bigger hospital, bigger, bigger hospital, biggest hospital. Um, and finally we ended up at uh, Boston Children's and they basically said, we can't figure out what's going on here. And they basically sent me home they took me off uh, flour, sugar, and dairy. So birthday parties weren't a lot of fun for me. <laughs> so um, once they took me off all that, and I, I guess I was living more of like a normal life, um, I got involved in the skating club because it gave my parents a morning off to kind of recharge their batteries. And from there, things changed remarkably because I, I just started to get well. You get on the ice and it's a new feeling. Your feet are sliding underneath you and you feel really, so you're hanging onto the wall. And I really felt like this was the first time I've been around a big activity with a lot of well kids. Kind of grew up for a big chunk of the year around a lot of sick kids, you know. So being around well kids was really an um, exciting environment for me. And so once I started getting around the ice without touching the wall and I started to play and, you know, get more confident, I realized that um, I could do something as well as the well kids. And soon after that, I realized that I could do something as well as the best athletes in my grade. And that first kind of taste of self-esteem is a pretty powerful thing. 
pretty much all you want to do after that is that. You know, I want more of that because now I, I feel kind of confident, secure for the first time in my life. You know, being the littlest one is always hard because um, I, I wasn't really ever chosen, you know, even last, you know, for a lot of the sports. So getting into skating was kind of an equalizer for me and, and I, I loved it and it just became my world. My senior in high school, my parents basically said that they ran out of money. And so that would be my last year in skating. My mother was going through cancer and chemo and uh, surgeries and all that. And um, so I went, to, I, I, for that was the first year I kind of went all in. And um, I ended up winning junior nationals, which was a huge deal because if I would have been fourth or third or even like even sixth, better than I've ever done before, I probably wouldn't have caught the eye of a coach who had a sponsor that allowed me to keep skating. Um, so um, that was my senior year. I made it to the 1980 Olympics as the third guy on a three-man team. So there was no expectation for me to medal or anything else, but I still garnered a lot of attention. I was elected to carry the flag in the opening ceremony, which I still to this day, how do they do that? Um, and then I came in fifth, which was three places higher than I dreamed of, be, of coming. So fast forward, you know, from October of the next year, I won my first competition of October 1980, and then all the way through to March of 1984, I never lost a competition. So going into Sarajevo for the Olympics, I was a heavy favorite to win. And back in those days, there was three events, the compulsory figures, the short program, and the long program. And I knew going in that if I were top three in all three, that I couldn't lose. So the strategy going in was build a lead. So no matter what happens in the long program, you'll be okay. I wanted to place as high as I could in figures, which was my nemesis event. I hated figures. I just, I was never any good at them. And, um, I won the figures in Sarajevo. I beat the best guy in the world. By the time I got into the long program, I was sick as a dog. The whole right side of my head was just congested and full. I couldn't hear out of my right ear. So balance was off, you know, just timing and exhaustion and burnout, all that stuff. So going on the ice that day, I was kind of get my opening position, do not choke. I got through my first jump, missed my second jump, got through the rest. The very last uh, triple of the program, I doubled. So for someone who hadn't missed in six weeks, one jump in any run through, which I did a run through every day in my, of my long program, I never missed a jump for the month and a half approaching the Olympics. For me to miss two, it was devastating. So the odds were that I was gonna win. It was just, I wanted to win in a big way, but God had other plans. Scott eventually won the gold medal in the 1984 Olympics. As Scott continued a successful run as a skater, he honored his mother, who he lost to cancer when he was just a teenager. Scott describes this loss and the first time he would face his own cancer crisis. I lost my mother to cancer, and that was devastating. It was a, 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 an unbelievable day. Uh, she was the center of my universe at the time. And then I realized when she passed that I wanted to honor her in a healthy way. And uh, so I, I, I got to work and it, it allowed me to win all those worlds and nationals and Olympics and all that. And then when I'm diagnosed with cancer, it, it, um, it was really unique that um, all of a sudden I remembered how she went through it. And it was not a horrible thing. Like I was scared and I was nervous and I had, you know, good support, really good support in helping me get through, you know. Um, dear people around me, um, good friends, um, good doctors, um, management, you know, you know, all that. And so I, I did the chemo, but there was something gnawing at me the whole time. And it, and it was, you know, I, I had to stop because I was going through chemo and I wasn't on the ice and I was just trying to get through this cancer experience. And I realized that there was something inside of me that was truly empty. And um, I didn't know what that was. I just felt like I wasn't the person I, I was supposed to be or that I wanted to be. It was a pretty lonely time because I needed to be alone, you know. Um, 
I, again, I wasn't who, I, I knew that something in me was toxic, broken, not right. And it had nothing to do with the cancer. The cancer actually allowed me to see it for the first time. And I'm able to process it now. Back then I was like, I, I'm just, I, I'm unsettled. I need to go, I need to get out, I need to do, you know. And so it was three years after I um, was diagnosed with cancer, three years to the day that I met Tracy. And um, I just thought she was a friend of a friend and just said hi to her and had no idea that she was gonna be the one that saved me because she's the one that truly brought me to Christ. And so we were dating and she said to me, where are you in your relationship with Jesus? It's important. If we're gonna keep going, I, I need to know that. And I said what anybody smart in my position would say. I said, well, where do you want me to be? Because <laughs> I liked her a lot. I loved her. And um, so I told her all of my inhibitions, all of my failures uh, in faith and all these mis um, understandings and all this stuff that comes with being all invested in the secular world and accumulating wealth and doing all these things. It was like, I was very focused on that more than anything else. And then when, um, when Jesus kind of showed up, it was like, well, I need to pay attention to this. I met with her minister. I told him all my apprehensions, all my, um, my feelings about denominational faith. I didn't understand it for what it is and what it, you know, what it's always been. And so he just said, I couldn't agree with you more. I was like, really? <laughs> wow, really? And he goes, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the separation with Christian community. It's religion, it's not faith. It's a different thing. So he said, have you ever read this book? And he held up a Bible and I go, I've tried, but I don't understand it. I don't, I don't know, what, I, I, it just seemed like a book of fables to me. And he said, no, 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 here's, it's, do you like history? And I said, I love history, it's my favorite, my favorite subject in school. And he goes, then you'll love this book. When you read it, understand that these aren't just stories of people. These are stories of how God touched these people. God is in every single page of this book, every single page. He did this, he did everything. It's a book of history, these things happened. Now read it. And when you get to the, the New Testament part, we're gonna have to sit down and talk about that because it's a little different than the first part. So he, he, he mentored me, nurtured me. He was like a, almost like a member of the family. He married me and Tracy. He baptized me and I think it was his, his calm intellectual and um, sort of this familial uh, stance that he took with me that allowed me to just sort of be, go in with 100% confidence and knowing that I, I wasn't gonna fail at this. Where before I just didn't know, what are the rules of the game? It's like not about that, it's about learning and growing and understanding who you are in your relationship with Christ because we're all different. And he has a unique relationship with every single one of us. And it was like, I can do that. I, I can do that. Six years after beating his first bout with cancer, Scott once again faced the terrible disease, this time in his brain. And so, um, you know, brain tumor number one was, I had to tell my wife and 14 month old son that I am now I have a brain tumor. And I thought I was gonna be a complete burden to both of them. And um, those were my feelings going in. And, and she just, when I told her, she just grabbed both my hands and started to pray. And it was powerful, really powerful. And then from there, um, you know, we had the biopsy and um, it was successful and, and, um, and we just um, survived that. Six years later, it came back. And that one felt different. That one felt like a kick in the stomach. And I remember um, when I, I told Michelle, who works with me, I told her about it. She'd heard me speak enough and, and she just sort of like, with tears in her eyes, she giggled a little bit. And I was like, 
what are you, what's, what are you thinking? She goes, I can't wait to see where this one takes you. And I thought, now there's somebody that knows you. There's somebody that understands your journey because every single time I've been knocked down, it was to re reset my course and to allow me to live the life that I'm supposed to be living. And so I started making changes in my diet. I started making changes in the way that I lived. I started I changed my water. I, I, I eliminated all this stuff that I knew would put my body at, in stress or harm and allow this tumor to take off and do its will. And I just sort of, I told the doctor, he goes, what do you want to do? And I said, I'm going to tap the brakes and just, let's just keep an eye on it. We caught it early enough where we can keep an eye on it. And I went back um, months later and it hadn't grown. It's like, that's the best news possible because the nature of these tumors is they grow until they start pushing into things and then they create all kinds of chaos and havoc. And, and then I kept doing what I was doing. And um, if anything, I ramped it up a little bit more. And I went back months later and it shrunk. I asked my surgeon, can you explain this? Because I'm not familiar with the cranio ever shrinking without treatment. And he goes, God. So God gets all the glory all the time. And this one I really recognized was I'm being moved again. I don't know what towards or to what, for what purpose he has for me now, but I'm being moved again. Going through cancer is an interesting business. When I was diagnosed, I, the internet was, you know, source of information, right? So I go to the internet and everything was written in like for third year medical students or oncologists or whatever. And I realized that how many people actually get cancer that have the education in order to process this information? Zero, maybe 1%. Okay, note to self. And then I realized that I wanted to quit at round three. I didn't know how I was doing. I had all these other things going on where I was getting other illnesses or be, during my chemo and am I supposed to be this sick? I was so depressed and I, I didn't know. I was flying blind. Nobody in my circle of friends knew, you know, how to speak to me or, or, or how to relate because they, they didn't go through it. And so coming out of my survivorship, I decided that I wanted to give back to the Cleveland Clinic because um, the care they gave me was extraordinary and um, I just felt like I, I needed to make a difference in the cancer community and they might be a really good partner. And so we started the CARES initiative and building a website called chemocare.com which describes everything about the chemotherapy experience in eighth grade English and Spanish and now with Google Translate, any language in the world. So now you can go on, every single drug is listed in combination or in individual uh, terms and it explains to you what they're designed to do, how they work, and then it lists the side effects. And then there's a whole another section about how to manage every single known side effect to, to chemotherapy. And I thought, that's good. I figured if we did three million hits a year, that was like, yes, we're really serving the cancer community. And right now it's doing um, almost, probably by now, almost three million hits a month. So it's doing really good work. And then the other side of it was the, the kind of the loneliness of cancer and not knowing where I was, how I was doing. And so I decided the best person to do that would be a survivor. And so we created the Fourth Angel Mentoring Program. So first angel's your oncologist, your second angel's your oncology nurse, your third angel's your friends and family. There needed to be a fourth angel. And the fourth angel is someone who's been there, done that. They can, you know, talk to you in language that you need to hear and, and guide you through your experience, you know, and, and share best, their best uh, practices and, and be able to describe things of how they felt when they were going through it. So it's, it's truly um, mentoring and role modeling, and it's booming. Cancer was the best thing ever because it totally showed me who I was and what I was missing, and it, it took, totally took me on a different path. Without that, my life wouldn't be what it is today, and I'm so grateful for it. Scott believes that anyone can adopt the mindset of a champion to help reach their dreams and become the person God designed them to be. He talks about this concept in his new book, Finish First, Winning Changes Everything, which released earlier this year. 
competition is a really great thing. Um, I, I think it, it keeps us on time, it keeps us moving forward, it keeps us um, healthy, it keeps us um, alive inside. And so um, in the book we talk about uh, what it takes to be um, victorious in life and how it is so important that we take on um, this uh, champion in life mindset in order to be the person that we are called and the person that we are designed to be. And so it talks about showing up every day, about being accountable, all these, all these things that really have, have been a recipe for success for so many people. I use a lot of examples, but it's also teaching us how to process failure. It's a very short book, which means that I want you to get to work. <laughs> so I want you to get busy. I don't want you to be scared off by something that's gonna take you three months to get through. Um, it is a guide to and an argument for competing and winning. And once you start building a life built on these uh, foundation of these little successes, and that means showing up or doing something that moves you forward, all those are victories. And you start to build your victories and then pretty soon a big one shows up. And once you're able to, to do that, that changes everything. It changes the quality of your life. It changes the, uh, the way others look at you. It changes you know opportunities that come your way. And I just felt like now in our history, it was really important that um, you know, we just start competing again. I do believe that God has called us to be someone for his purpose and to deny our purpose, to deny our ability to serve in whatever capacity that is. Um, I think it's cheating ourselves in our life experience in this time that we have here to live joyfully and triumphantly. I'm not trying to teach people how to do one thing. I'm trying to give them the permission and the structure to do anything, anything. Scott reads to us from the August 28th entry of Jesus Calling, which also happens to be on his birthday. So here's my birthday. Grow strong in the light of my presence. As my face shines upon you, you receive nutrients that enhance your growth in grace. I designed you to commune with me face to face, and this interaction strengthens your soul. Such communion provides a tiny glimpse of what awaits you in heaven, where all barriers between you and my glory will be removed. This meditative time with me blesses you doubly. You experience my presence here and now, and you are refreshed by the hope of heaven when you will know me in ecstatic joy. Oof, it's beautiful. I have a friend um, whose wife became a minister. And he said, um, here's my opinion on all of this. Because my wife told me this recently and it just um, absolutely 100%. What's the definition of the gospel? I go, tell me. And he said, you are loved, deal with it. <laughs> Man, that floors me every single time. And that, I, that I'm okay, no matter what I've done, I'm okay. If I rest in Him, always. And I'm gonna trip a lot. I'll get up too. And just try to learn and grow. Cause I got a lot of learning and a lot of growing to do. <laughs> I was a skater, so in my skating life and career, I estimated on the low end, that I've fallen 41,600 times. <laughs> the cool thing is, is I've gotten up 41,600 times. And once you're used to getting up and processing failure, um, really nothing can defeat you in, in that way because you're used to putting yourself out there and understanding that failure is information, failure is an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to grow. For more information about Scott's new book, Finish First, or the Scott Hamilton Cares Foundation, please visit scotthamilton.com. We'll be right back after this brief message about a free offer from Jesus Calling. Want a daily reminder that we can have hope, peace, and joy each day in Jesus? Now it's as easy as opening an email. The Jesus Calling Daily Email brings you a thought from the Jesus Calling family of devotionals every day. Brighten up your inbox with this little reminder and take a minute to connect with God during your day. 
To sign up to get your free daily thought from Jesus Calling, please visit jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. That's jesuscalling.com slash daily dash email. Our next guest is a wife, mom, and cancer survivor. Rhonda Hodge faced cancer in her family over the years, with her husband, her best friend, and even with her own college-aged daughter, only to find out that she too had the disease. She describes how she faced the diagnoses of family members and friends, and how she clung to God through her own diagnosis. My name is Rhonda Hodge. I am 51 years old. I'm a dedicated Christian. I'm a wife and a mother. I was actually raised in Sevier County, Tennessee, the hometown of the famous Dolly Parton. I grew up in a loving family. I have a wonderful mom, dad, and I have one younger brother. My brother and I, uh, there's six years difference in us, but we've always been very close. I was a tomboy. I love playing outside, but I was also a girly girl. I could go from playing in the dirt to being in a beauty pageant. And as a child, my parents, they worked really hard for us. My dad worked with our local electric system and retired from there. I remember, though, when I was young, my parents, they taught us so many good things about life and about people. And they never wanted us to um, look at anyone differently. I never knew if someone had more than me or less than me. My parents sacrificed so much for me. And what a great life I had. What a great childhood I had. Um, We had struggles like any family. Later in my years of when I was 17, my parents divorced and they had been married for many years. And that was a real struggle for all of us. But um, God got my family through all that. He's always been there for us. And uh, he got us through that. And I can actually say that my mom and dad are friends now. And I'm just proud to be blessed with such a wonderful and supportive family that I have. My husband, Randy, was diagnosed with prostate cancer at the age of 47. He's a wonderful father and a hard worker, and we just do life great together. We were married um, eight years before we had our first child, which was our daughter, Tiffany. And then three and a half years later, we had our son, Mason, and they two wonderful children that God blessed us with. So we were just heartbroken at hearing that word cancer. And we really didn't know what um, kind of turn that that was going to take in our lives at the time. His doctor recommended that he have surgery and uh, they got all the cancer. They were sure that they got all the cancer. Um, His recovery was very difficult. It took a long time to uh, get back to his self. That's a hard recovery, prostate cancer is. And I'm happy to say that he is now an eight-year survivor and doing great. Tiffany graduated from the Johnson University College, and she was a media communications major. She had been traveling, and she had come down with a cold and just couldn't knock it. It was just kept hanging on. And of course, like all mothers do, I made her doctor's appointments, and we had to cancel a couple of them due to traveling. And we finally um, made her one, and I told her no matter what, she was not going to cancel it. And I made it with an allergy doctor, uh, assuming, like mothers do, that it was asthma uh, because she couldn't kick it and that she had something going on. So she went to the allergy doctor on April the 14th of 2014. And they diagnosed her with uh, having breathing problems, so they automatically sent her to the emergency room for a chest x-ray. And at that time, she called and told me, because I was not with her, uh, that what they, were, they wanted to actually admit her to the emergency room. And um, we automatically went to the hospital to be with her. They went through a series of tests in that one day and end up taking fluid off of her lung because it had collapsed. Didn't know at the time exactly what they were looking at. And a few days later, after many, many tests, they came in and told us that she had cancer. And at that time, they didn't know if it was uh, leukemia or lymphoma. They needed to do more tests. And 
Our family was devastated. I can't even tell you. Uh, you have your daughter fixing to graduate college and your son gonna graduate high school and all this is happening at one time and we're just amazed. We just can't believe that we're hearing all this. The oncologist suggested that we go to Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, which is about four hours from where we live. She thought Tiffany would get the best treatment there, and we did that. And we spent 37 days the first time in the hospital uh, without even getting outside, she and I did. Once we had gotten there, they did decide that it was leukemia and that it was really bad. Of course, as a parent, they can tell you that you're not really grasping how bad it is. It's just, you're just not getting it. It's not sinking in. You just want your kid well. That's all you're thinking about. Tiffany had many rounds of chemo. The first chemo bout was seven days straight for 24 hours a day. Um, She tolerated so much. I mean, the cancer was so bad. And once we did get out, the cancer had, they did many PET scans to check the cancer, and the cancer had uh, dissipated. It hadn't completely went away, but it had shrunk. Um, Because her leukemia was not like anybody else's leukemia. It was completely different. Most people that have leukemia, it is in their bone marrow and blood. But she was very rare. And uh, that... uh, within itself was a battle. Uh, Little did we know that as parents, we really were not grasping how bad it was. She was so tough through it all and uh, so many tests, so many doctors, so many days, and basically she fought it for a whole year. Uh, We were in and out of the hospital. We did get to come home during that time. In October of that year of 2014, she had a bone marrow transplant, which our son was her donor, which he was a perfect match. And that is just by the grace of God, because even with a sibling, a lot of times that doesn't happen. But it did in our case. We were so blessed by so many things. Great doctors, great nurses, great hospital. She was a Christian. She loved life to the fullest. And uh, she just brought so much joy to our lives. She um, fought hard, but she was ready when the time came to go. And she passed away uh, in March of 2015. And uh, she truly taught me so much about life. She taught me so much about having faith and not losing hope because she never lost her faith or her hope in God. She knew that she where she was going and she knew that God was going to take care of her no matter what. And he did exactly that. I went for my annual routine mammogram in January of 2016, and at the time, I was four months behind due to Tiffany's illness and death. Um, Normally, I was always on time, and on January the 12th, 2016, I myself was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. Learning that I had cancer (laughs) was truly unreal. Boy, talk about hitting you hard. I couldn't believe that I was hearing that news. It just really had to sink in. Is this really happening? I mean, we just lost our daughter, and I just went through cancer. Can I do this again? I, I just don't know. Lord, can I do this again? What What's happening? I did not even immediately cry when they told me. I think that cancer has been so much a part of my life that at that time, I was just amazed that it was even happening. I remember my husband he was sitting in a chair right beside of me and he just took my hand and he said, honey, you can do this. I know you can. He goes, I have seen you. I have seen how strong you are. I know what you can do and you can do this. And I remember looking at him and saying, you know, if Tiffany can go through this and do all that she did and not complain and know that God was going to take care of her, then I can do it. Surely, surely I can do it. 
And I knew that it was going to be a lot because I had been there. I'd been down this cancer road before and I knew all the tests, the doctors, the appointments, the chemo, the radiation. I knew what to expect, unlike some people. And sometimes I wonder if that's not a curse when you know, because it's just like it's you just know too much. And I actually had to just say, God, you've got this. I know that I have been through everything, but I know that you've been with me through all my struggles every day. And I know that you can get me through this. I truly knew in my heart that he would get me through it. And that day, my biggest fear was at that time of having to tell our son. I remember that very day of finding out we had, I had cancer. Once we got to the car, that was my big thing. Are we going to tell him? And my husband said, yes, we have to tell him. And I knew that I had to be honest with him, that he had been through so much in his life, and especially as much as cancer had touched his life, that I had to be up front with him. So I immediately called him and told him what was going on and that I had been diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. And I told him without crying. And I just told him like I was talking to him on the phone about any kind of conversation because God had it and I could feel that God had me. And, and just being able to tell him, son, it's going to be okay. Mom's going to be fine. I want to get through this. It'll be over before you know it. And I think that put him at ease because he was such a trooper through it all. And I just think that sometimes we don't give our kids enough credit um, when something in our lives happen. I think we, we do need to include them. A lot of times we don't include them because we're trying to spare them the hurt, the heartache of, and the worry of worrying about the parent. But in my case, um, it was better for us to be up front with him. And he, he took it and he did, he did great with it. I think in order to realize that you have to turn it over to God, you've got to come to him. You've got to be at your weakest point. And there's a time that that's going to happen that you're finally going to break and you're going to be at your weakest point. I remember times with my daughter, I would be just to a point, a doctor comes in and gives you bad news. The PET scan does not look like they want it to look. And you're just, it's all you can do to hold it together without screaming, why God? Why? I mean, that's your first reaction. Okay, she's had enough. I've had enough. We want this over. We want to be well. But something about you inside of me, the way I felt, I knew that I had to say, God, you have got to take this off of me. Because if you don't take it from me, I cannot function. I cannot do the things that I need to do. I cannot do the things that I need to do as a caregiver on that end of it, I could not do it to take care of her the way I needed to take care of it. If I let all this trouble me and worry me and bog me down so much that I could not breathe. That's when I finally came to a point in my life to realize one day at a time, one minute at a time, just thank God for what I have for that minute and get through that day one day at a time. I have finally, in my 51 years, figured out that you can't live like that. You have to live for today. You have to live in today. You have to be there. You have to be present in today. And if you do that, you can function in life so much better, I think. I first received my Compassion That Compels bag right before my first chemo treatment. Um, A very special friend sent it to me. Um, When it came, it was in this brown box, and it was delivered by UPS to my home, and it had beautiful Rhonda written on it. And I had no idea what it was. And I opened it up, and there's this amazing bag in it that 
has a Bible verse on it, which is Joshua 1, 9 on the front of it, uh, be strong and courageous. And when I started taking out the stuff, I was just amazed at all the great stuff that it has in it. Uh, a blanket, uh, a journal, uh, a Jesus Calling devotional, which was one of my favorites, uh, a cup, uh, some tea, some scripture mint, pens, just all kinds of great stuff in this bag that you would need for your journey in cancer. My first encounter with Jesus Calling was when my daughter became ill. Someone sent her Jesus Today and then also a Jesus Calling. And we love both of them. And uh, we would read them. Uh, we had both of those. And we would read it. E- Jesus Calling was such a great devotional to me. It just seemed like every day uh, was talking about me or something happening in my life. And after having a chemo treatment, I just really couldn't concentrate on a lot. So reading, I love to read. But reading became really hard for me to focus on. But doing the Jesus Calling was small, and I could read it, and I could meditate on it throughout the day. And it's just been a special devotional uh, for me. I actually have three now. Um, I still have my daughters, and then I received two more uh, during my time of dealing with my cancer. And I love giving them as gifts. I just think they're uh, a great devotional. They... They're just so inspiring with every day and every um, devotion. There's just always something in there for me. And it just seems like that God is actually um, (laughs) talking directly to me most days uh, of telling me what I should or shouldn't do. My favorite devotional would be uh, March the 22nd. And that would be the first day that I had my chemo treatment in 2016. And it is, rejoice and be thankful as you walk with me through this day. Practice trusting and thanking me along the way. Trust is a channel through which my peace flows into you. Thankfulness lifts you up above your circumstances. I do my greatest work through people with grateful, trusting hearts. Rather than planning and evaluating, practice trusting and thanking me continually. I absolutely love that. I just think that that is like, that has got me through so many days. My husband took pictures of me and uh, I have pictures with my blanket and my Jesus calling and I'm getting my, what they call the red devil. A lot of people know what that is, a chemo treatment that I was getting. There's a picture of it. And um, I was very excited with all my new stuff. So I wanted to show it off on Facebook because Everybody was very supportive and keeping up with me, and I was putting a lot of things on Facebook so that my family and friends could keep up with me. But um, during this time, my friend and I got involved with Compassion That Compels Ministry, and we are now very passionate about it, she and I both, and we have uh, started a Compassion That Compels Ministry in our area. And we are now delivering bags in our community and recruiting others to get involved in the ministry, which has been a blessing to uh, many of us here. Um, The bags are just a starting point to be able to um, talk with someone about having cancer. It's just, and not only talk to them about having cancer, but talk to them about their relationship with Christ. Um, it's a starting point for the whole, to build a whole friendship from all that. I am completely uh, done with all my treatments. I am cancer free and uh, doing well. I am 90% back to my old self. I don't know if you'll ever be 100% back to your old self, but I'm 90% back to my old self. And I am loving life and um, enjoying every day that I can of just being well Uh, because it was a journey that I never expected to take myself uh, especially after being through cancer with so many other people Uh, I didn't expect to be the one with cancer but that was the way it ended up and um, I'm happy to say that um, it's been a great journey 
uh, it's been a, a learning experience for me. I think that it has only brought me closer to God. It's amazing what God can do if you do rejoice and you are thankful for everything, even the Even the struggles that you're going through. He wants us to be thankful for those. And I know that's hard to understand when you're going through it. But I think if you are thankful and if you can see the good side of it. I know when when I first found out that I did have cancer, my thoughts were, okay, God, this is happening. And if anything at all can come out of this, please let it be something good. Let me be able to use this, my struggles, my journey through cancer to help someone else that's going to be battling it. That was my prayer. And Jesus calling helped me every day with that because every day I could read it. And like I said, I always took it to chemo treatments with me. And it always just gave me a comforting feeling to know that uh, whatever's happening through the day, there was my Jesus calling. I could always look back at it and think about, okay, is this what God would want me to do today? To find out more about Compassion That Compels and how to send a compassion bag to a woman who is facing cancer treatments, please visit CompassionThatCompels.org. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we visit with Mark and Danielle Herzlick. Mark is a linebacker in the NFL for the New York Giants. Danielle is a captain in the New Jersey National Guard and a certified personal trainer. As young people, they both faced difficult circumstances early in their lives, both together and separately. They talk about the strength God gave them as they live through these tough challenges. Some people, uh, myself included, have a hard time with vulnerability. And they think that if I show weakness, if I, if I show fear, if I show that I am vulnerable in this moment, how is that going to look to everyone else? And I, and I encourage them, say, look, you live a vulnerable life in God's eyes, mm-hmm. and he loves you unconditionally for it. Do you love hearing great stories of faith each week via the Jesus Calling podcast? We want to hear from you. If you haven't already subscribed to the Jesus Calling podcast, visit the Jesus Calling page at iTunes.com and hit the subscribe button. While you're there, we'd love for you to leave us a review and tell us how you feel about the show and what future guests you'd love to see. Your reviews and subscription help us share these stories of faith to more people who need the hope and encouragement of Jesus Calling. If you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.